every time I hear at Calvary, it reminds me of my beloved friend Philip Newell, whose father, William R. Newell, wrote that song. And Philip Newell was the director of the Great Commission Prayer League for many years. I was on that board. And he told me one day, he said, every time you, um, you hear at Calvary, written by my father, just remember he wrote it because of me. <laughs> Apparently Phil was somewhat of a rebel at one point. And then came to the Lord and had a marvelous ministry at the Moody Bible Institute and other places. And he said, he wrote that song because of me. Well, he wrote it because of me. <laughs> Never forget that the cross of Jesus Christ is a plus sign. It reconciles us to God and to one another, our Father. We've been discovering that effective prayer involves that relationship, my relationship to you and my relationship to God. It also involves worship. Hallowed be your name. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And it involves kingship. When I pray, I have to keep reminding myself I'm at a throne of grace. Because it's grace, there is sympathy, and because there's a throne, there's authority. And when we pray, we have the sympathy of our Savior. He knows how you feel better than you know how you feel. He feels those burdens more than we do. And there's authority to back up our praying. Your kingdom come. Prayer involves kingship, doesn't it? And prayer involves partnership, and that's our thought for today. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've already said, and I'm not sure who made this statement originally, the purpose of prayer is not to get our will done in heaven, it's to get God's will done on earth. And we don't come to the throne to tell God what to do. We come to the throne for him to tell us what to do. And so when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're becoming partners with God. Now, there are some answers to prayer that I cannot have a part in, except to pray. There are other answers to prayer that I can have a part in. I'm sure you heard about the rather well-to-do Christian businessman who was leading his family in devotions, and he was especially praying for missionaries who needed financial help. No sooner had he said, Amen, than his little boy, and little boys usually speak up. My Swedish grandfather used to say that little children and drunks always tell the truth. I'm not so sure about the drunks, but the children I'm pretty sure about. And the little boy spoke up and said, Daddy, if I had your checkbook, I could answer your prayers. That's somewhat intimidating. <laughs> Prayer is a partnership between the believer and God. When I think of the marvel of prayer, it involves two intercessors, doesn't it? The Lord Jesus is interceding for us up in heaven. The Holy Spirit is interceding within, according to Romans chapter 8, that we might pray in the will of God. And so as I yield to the Spirit and come through the Son to the Father, God puts together that amazing thing called prayer. Alas, too many times I'm not praying in the Spirit. My praying is selfish. Too many times I don't really come in the name of the Lord Jesus. I come in my own name with what I want trying to tell God what to do. Partnership. Now, if we are going to pray in the will of God, there are certain basic principles that we have to understand. 
John wrote and said uh, in 1 John chapter 5 that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Again, George MacDonald said, in whatever man does without prayer, he must fail miserably or succeed more miserably. He gave them their request and sent leanness to their souls. What are these principles? I want to suggest four of them to you. We're praying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Principle number one is found in Psalm 33, verse 11. It's this. Write it down. The will of God comes from the heart of God. Psalm 33, 11 says this. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. I didn't even know that verse was in the Bible. I know I'd read it. Have you ever had the experience of looking at a verse and saying, where'd that come from? You say, is that in every version? You go, check, yeah, there it is. It's even in the Hebrew and the Greek. We were in our first pastorate. Now, first pastorates are difficult because you have stars in your eyes and little money in your pocket and uh, they're keeping you poor and God is uh, keeping you humble and we were in a building program. I was pastoring a church while going to seminary. It was an old metal building that the city had condemned and been too kind to make us tear down. And of course the dear people love that building and I don't criticize them for that. We get attached to buildings. Some of them had been married in that building. They'd had friends and loved ones buried from that building, babies dedicated, people saved. And we just had to replace that building. We talked to several financial experts. An expert is an ordinary spurt under pressure. <laughs> and uh, they said, you can't do it. You just think you don't have the resources to do it. But we started anyway. <laughs> and tore down. By the way, the old building was taken by a Spanish congregation on the other side of town. They came and said, we need a building. Fine, you can have it. And of course, as we tore it down, people stood there and wept. And I don't criticize them for that. This, this was a landmark that was being taken away. Well, I, I am I'm not a builder. I couldn't build a birdhouse if you put a revolver to my head. Uh, I'm not mechanical, I can't read blueprints, and here I am pastoring a church that's building a building. God knew that, and uh, I got discouraged. Now, you've never been discouraged, but I got discouraged. We were on a little vacation, went to see our, my wife's family up in Wisconsin, and I was sitting in the backyard of their house feeling sorry for myself, licking my wounds and saying, this building program is going to kill me. And I picked up my little pocket New Testament and began to read in the Psalms, and I got to Psalm 33, verse 11, and about fell out of the deck chair. How long has that been there? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. God's will is going to be done. But where's that will come from? The thoughts of his heart, the plans of his heart to all generations. And I just said, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been critical and I've been unhappy and I've been resisting, but now I realize that all that you're doing comes from your heart. You see, a lot of people have the idea the will of God is punishment. The will of God's not punishment. The will of God is nourishment. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my Father in heaven and to finish his work. Nourishment. I feel sorry for people whose work doesn't nourish them. I don't mean physically, I mean within. The will of God is not punishment, it's nourishment. Now sometimes that nourishment comes in a cup that's hard to drink. 
in the garden, my Lord prayed three times, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You see, at the beginning of his life, he says, his earthly ministry, he says, my food, my meat, my bread is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. And at the end of his ministry, he says, now I've got the cup. And it's not easy to drink that cup sometimes. Was it easy for Abraham to drink the cup when he took Isaac up on Mount Moriah? No. No. Was it easy for Jeremiah to drink the cup when they lowered him down into the well and left him there? No. Was it easy for Paul to drink the cup when they let him outside of Rome and chopped off his head? No. No. Sometimes the will of God is tough to take but it's always good for us. You see, our Lord was able to take that cup because the Father mixed it. And the Father did not mix medicine or poison. He said to his son, I've mixed this cup. It's for you. It's tailor-made. Now take it. And he took it. And aren't we glad he did? Somebody here right now may, may be reaching out hesitatingly, haltingly, because the Father's handing you a cup. The doctor may have said, no, you're going to have surgery and it's not going to be easy. Or there may be some problem that you just, you'd wish it weren't there. And so we reach out rather haltingly and the Father says, don't be afraid. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and that counsel comes from my heart. The will of God comes from the heart of God. Young people in particular have the idea that the will of God is bondage. You know, the world has that attitude. Psalm 2, let's cast off their bonds. Let's break off these fetters. The will of God isn't bondage, it's freedom. The most wonderful freedom in the world is to do what God planned for us to do and become what God planned for us to become. You know what maturity is? A mature person knows who he is or she is. Mature people know who they are, they accept who they are, and they are who they are. They aren't trying to be somebody else. The will of God is not nourish, is not punishment, it's nourishment, it's not bondage it's freedom in Psalm 32 you're in Psalm 33 just look back at Psalm 32 verse 8 I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go I will guide you with my eye that doesn't sound like bondage that's what parents do parents instruct their children and teach them show them the way to go and then they keep their eye on them. my mother used to guide me with her eye We'd have guests at the house for Sunday dinner, and I had to sit and talk and entertain everybody, and she'd just look. She had a marvelous eye for guiding. My father had a marvelous hand <laughs> for guiding. But the psalmist goes on to say, do not be like the horse or the mule. Oh, you don't guide a horse or a mule with your eye. And sometimes you and I get rebellious and stubborn like the mule or we rush ahead like the horse. What's wrong with us? God says, now here's the way I want you to go. I'm going to teach you and instruct you and watch you. And woof, we go off on our own like the horse. Or we dig in like the mule. So what does God have to do? Well, they have no understanding which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Oh, Sometimes God has to reach down and put a bit and bridle on us or we won't do his will. That's not the ideal thing, is it? He had to give Jacob a limp. He said, Jacob, you haven't learned how to walk yet. I'm going to give you a limp. He gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, not because Paul was rebellious, but there was a danger there. Lest I should be exalted above measure. The will of God comes from the heart of God. I don't know about you, I don't want God to guide me with a bit and a bridle. I like what he says about Israel over in Hosea chapter 11 verse 4 where he said, I, 
I drew them with cords of love. That's the way I want God to guide me. I want him to draw me, not with a bit and a bridle, not with spurs to dig in, but just to draw me with cords of love and keep his eye on me. The will of God comes from the heart of God. Now, this means that the will of God is personal. Not only loving, it's personal. A book came out some years ago trying to prove that there is no specific will of God for each of our lives. I disagree with that thesis, although there are many good things in that book. I believe God's will is personal. I believe it would be wrong for me to be doing anything other than what God's called me to do and I'm trying to do in his will. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Did you know that God's will begins in your conception? Did you know that? Even before you were conceived, God had a plan. Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. The word there for covered is the word to weave. You wove me together. Life is a weaving. This is one reason why abortion just bothers me. Here is God weaving something beautiful, and we come in and rip it from the womb, take it off the loom. Here is God doing a beautiful work. We tear it apart. But who did the forming? God. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Then why destroy it? Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame, here we are back at the bones again now, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now in verse 15, he equates mother earth with, in verse uh, 13, the mother's womb. We came from the dust, didn't we? Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Isn't that amazing? No wonder he goes on to say, how precious are your thoughts. That's amazing. That before I was conceived, God saw what he wanted to weave. And at conception, he brought together just the genetic structure he wanted. I am not an accident. Now, I can imagine at my conception the genes must have had a good time. I suppose they were getting their orders from the designer gene. <laughs> and they said, they, they said, what, what is this fellow, what is this fellow going to be? Is he going to be an athlete? No. Oh, my, no. An artist? No way. Musician? Oh, no, no. Mechanic? Oh, no way. Well, there's not much left. That's him. <laughs> now, today I can laugh at that, but when I was a kid, I didn't laugh at it. I wept over it because I was the last kid chosen for every team all during grade school. That builds your popularity and your ego. And I thank God for a school teacher who in fifth grade got me off to one side and she said to me, I'm going to give you a suggestion. I want you to follow it. I said, what's that? I mean, she knew I wasn't an artist. She knew I wasn't a mechanic. She knew I wasn't an athlete. She said, I want you to do a lot of reading and a lot of writing. And her counsel was good. God didn't put me together to coach a team. He didn't put me together to lay block. He put me together to put words together. And so why should I weep over what I'm not when I can thank God for what he has done? The will of God comes from the heart of God. It's loving and it's personal. God said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart. 
That encourages me. And then when God saved me, he said, there are certain jobs I want you to do. We all quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We forget verse 10. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before prepared that we should walk in them. And I just have enough faith to believe that when God saved me, he had a plan for my life. And I'm glad that that plan is not a closed machine. A lot of folks have the idea the will of God is a, a closed machine. And if you make a mistake or sin, the machine grinds to a halt and you're done for. Oh, no. No, if that were the case, Jacob was done for. Moses was done for. David, Jonah, Peter. No, no. The will of God is a beautiful relationship, a loving, living relationship between me and my Father. It's like the parts of my body. If one part of my body goes haywire, the other parts compensate for it until we get it straightened out. And the will of God is this way. When Jacob was out of the will of God, God just readjusted things and brought him back. And when David was out of the will of God, God patiently readjusted things and brought him back. Do we pay for it when we sin? Of course. Does it mean it's the end? No. The will of God comes from the heart of God. God wants us to know his will. He says that in Acts 22, 14. He wants us to understand his will. That's Ephesians 5, 17. He wants us to do his will from our hearts. That's Ephesians 6, 6. It's one thing for me to do his will. Another thing to do it from my heart. Jonah finally did God's will, but not from his heart. And you know what? God also wants me to delight in his will. That's Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. To delight in the will of God like we would delight in a lovely meal. My food is to do the will of him that sent me. The will of God comes from the heart of God. So, when I pray, your will be done, I'm touching the very heart of God. God wills what he wills for us because he loves us. You say, I don't understand that. He's allowed things in my life that I don't see much love in them. Oh? Really? Well, I don't know why. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God never said he'd tell me why. God doesn't owe me any explanations. His children do not live on explanations. They live on promises. And there are plenty of promises in this book to carry me through the darkest, deepest valley. My wife's parents were called home within 24 hours of each other because of an auto accident down in Kansas. And uh, among my mother-in-law's souvenirs was this little poem she did not write the poem but this is her copy I know not by what methods rare but this I know God answers prayer I know not if the blessing sought will come in just the way I thought I leave my prayer to him alone whose will is wiser than my own. The will of God comes from the heart of God. Secondly, the will of God is revealed in the word of God. That's why prayer and the word go together. Now, don't separate them. I've been in some assemblies where it's all Bible, 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 no prayer. Lots of light, no heat. And alas, I've been in some assemblies where there's lots of prayer, 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 a lot of heat, but no light. They could use some Bible. It's balance. 
Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Then he goes on to say, but I will teach you. That's prayer and the word. Peter said uh, in Acts chapter 6, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Moses would go up on the mountain and intercede for Israel, and God would teach him, and he'd go down and tell the people. Go back up and intercede for Israel and go down and teach them. It takes both. We don't have enough prayer in our churches today. We need more prayer. The will of God is revealed in the Word of God. We have a lot of Bible but we need prayer to balance it. For when I hear the word of God, he teaches me. When I pray, that becomes a part of me. Now, there's some things God hasn't revealed. If you haven't yet marked Deuteronomy 29, 29 in your Bible, you better mark it. It says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Oh, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. That's one of the greatest verses in Scripture on Bible study. Dear friends, the purpose of Bible study is not to have a big head. It's to have a burning heart. When those Emmaus disciples were walking along so discouraged and Jesus joined them and he opened to them the Scriptures, the prophetic Scriptures, and they said, did not our heart burn within us? If when I study the Word of God, it gives me a big head instead of a burning heart, I'm not getting the message. Now, there are some secret things that God hasn't revealed. Don't be interested in those things. Don't waste your time. Don't try to figure out election and human responsibility. One of my professors said, you try to explain election, you'll lose your mind. Explain it away, you'll lose your soul. There are things in Scripture I don't know. We say you're supposed to. No, God's hidden them. And why should I waste my time with the hidden things when there are so many revealed things? And so we just leave it with God. So there are some hidden things. There are some revealed things. Now, those belong to us, but not just to us, to our children. Uh, dear friend, don't complain about the next generation unless you've done something to share the truth with them. Go through your Bible and find out what God says we older folks have as our responsibility to the younger generation. Not to criticize, but to be good examples to them and to pray for them, and to teach them. One reason why I have slowed down from the conference circuit to do more writing is I want to leave behind for the next generation something for them to read. It may not last for a long time, but I'm going to fulfill my obligation. David said, come you children, listen to me. I want to tell you about the fear of the Lord. You know what I wish would happen in every church? I shared this with my pastor last Friday when we had lunch together. I wish in every church they'd take five minutes on Sunday morning for a senior saint, a godly senior saint, just to get up and look at the congregation and say, if I had only five minutes to tell you one thing that you need to know, here it is. That could change our churches. When you get home this afternoon, sit down and say, Lord, you've taught me many lessons, and I've been down the road a long time now. Now, if I were to give one lesson to the young people in our church, what would it be? If I were to give one lesson in five minutes to the students at RGBI, what would it be? You know what else I'd do? I said to our pastor, I said, tape it. Just tape every one of these, and after a while you're going to have about... 25 or 30 testimonies of godly men and women who have walked with the Lord, put it on cassette, and every time a new member comes into the church, just give them a cassette. So I want you to listen to some of the lessons our people have learned. The Bible tells us to do this. 
Tell the children the fear of the Lord. Teach them the way of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. That we may do all the words of this law. So when I read my Bible, there's some things I don't understand. That's all right. There's some things God hasn't revealed. That's fine. He knows what he's doing. But there's some things he has revealed. You know that most of the decisions you and I make every day, the Bible tells us what to do. There are not many decisions I make that God doesn't have guidance for me. Take your concordance and find the little phrase, the will of God. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should keep your vessel holy. Paul wrote that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. So nobody ever prays, oh Lord, should I commit adultery? Oh Lord, should I go see this pornographic movie? We don't pray like that. The Bible says, here's the will of God. Be sanctified. God is not willing that any should perish. Lord, does this make, should this man be saved? Hey, let God worry about the elect. D.L. Moody used to pray, oh God, save the elect, and then elect some more. <laughs> I don't know about that theology, but I like the spirit. God who will have all men to be saved. Now, I don't understand how God elects and there's not any, I don't know. I'm just not going to worry about it. All I know is he said to me, get out there, tell them. So I never pray, dear Lord, should I help anybody be saved? <laughs> it's what he wants me to do. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God concerning you. What's the will of God? Be thankful. That takes care of my griping, my complaining. Lord, should I write this letter and complain? Well, I don't know. In everything, give thanks. Peter says it's the will of God that by doing good, you silence the mouths of wicked people. Do good. Do good to our unsaved neighbors. You find out an unsaved neighbor is sick and make him a bowl of soup. Take it over. That'd do more good than attract, maybe. Do good. The will of God comes from the heart of God. The will of God is revealed in the Word of God. I've noticed that God does not reveal his will to me all at once. Nor does, when I was in, in ministry with staff, nor did he reveal everything to me all the time. I used to tell the folks that back to the Bible, now look, here we had these five directors and a, an executive director, and we'd get together to pray and to plan. I'd say, look, men, if you think I have the oracle from God, I don't. But I see this, and I'd share that. And then Tom would say, well, you know, I've been thinking about this. And when people get together to seek the will of God, whether it's a husband and wife and children, or staff and staff people and staff leaders, it's like a picture puzzle. I don't, think the, I don't think the Lord gives everything to one person. I wouldn't want to be that one person. Boy, would the devil be after me. I don't think that he does that. I think that God gives a piece to, to Tom and a piece to Pete and a, a piece to Virgil, and, a, and, and we just sit down and we pray and we talk, and then these pieces fall together. That's why we pray, our Father, we need each other. That's the blessing of a godly wife who can help you to put the pieces together. And my children do too. I thank God for our four children. When I discuss some things with them, they have ideas. I told our youngest daughter that I wanted to take 1995 off as a year of Jubilee. It'll be my 50th anniversary of my conversion and the publication of the first book I wrote. I said, I'm just going to take it as a year of Jubilee and let my mind lie fallow. Judy said, Dad, it won't take all year. <laughs> <laughs> the will of God is revealed in the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean we play religious roulette. Oh, Lord, I need an answer. And you open it and you point, you know. Although General William Booth got his wife that way, he wasn't sure he was supposed to marry Catherine. 
And so he pulled all the shades down in his room and got on his knees with his open Bible, and he said, Lord, you're going to have to show me what to do. And he opened it up and pointed, and he was in Ezekiel, <laughs> where the two sticks came together. <laughs> well, all right. All right. As a third principle, the will of God is accomplished through the people of God. Now, his will is accomplished by angels. I know that. I've never seen an angel that I know of. There may have been people come into my life who actually were God's angels. I don't know. God uses angels, but God uses his people. Now, this is the important point. When I pray, your will be done, I have got to be available as a partner. You know where God starts to answer prayer? In the person who's praying. That's Ephesians 3.21, isn't it? Ephesians 3.20, 20, 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. But notice the next phrase. According to the power that works in, what's the next word? Us. Oh. Here's Moses for 40 years out taking care of the sheep. Ph.D. from the university in Egypt. Taking care of sheep. Dumbest animal God ever made. That wasn't the kind of sheepskin he was expecting. You know what he was doing while he was taking care of the sheep? Praying. Oh, God, deliver the people in Egypt. Oh, deliver them, deliver them. So God showed up one day in a burning bush. He said, you know, I've heard their cries, and I've heard your prayers, and I'm going to deliver my people. Praise God! I'm going to send you! Oh, that's a horse of a different wheelbase. Lord, have you considered Aaron? <laughs> now I'm going to send you. Now, be careful now. You start praying about something, God answers his will, God accomplishes his will through his people, Nehemiah. Uh, his brother Hanani had won a trip to the Holy Land. And so he and some of his friends went down to the Holy Land and they came back and Nehemiah casually says, um, how are things down in Judah, in Jerusalem? And Hanani said, terrible. The walls are down, the gates are burned. The tour buses of the Gentiles go by and people laugh. People are demoralized. Nehemiah said, oh, we've got to pray about that. So he began to pray. And you know what happened. He gave up his posturepedic mattress in the palace for a, for a sleeping bag and headed down to Jerusalem to start answering his prayers. To me, it's a marvel that Almighty God is willing for me to be a part of the answer. Now, sometimes I can't be. Here are my missionary friends flying from um, Nairobi to, uh, to London. I can't fly the plane. I can't pass out the snacks. I can't even stand to eat the snacks. But I can pray that God would rule and overrule and bring safety. But when I do pray, I've got to be willing to be a part of the answer. Oh, God, the school needs a new dormitory. Am I willing to be a part of the answer? Oh, Lord, there are sick people in our church. Well, am I willing to be a part of the answer and go help them? The will of God is accomplished by the people of God. We're laborers together with God. It's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, which leads us to our fourth principle. Principle number one, the will of God comes from the heart of God. God wills what he wills because he loves us. Principle number two, the will of God is revealed in the word of God. That means I've got to spend time in the word and prayer. If you abide in me, that's prayer, and my words abide in you, that's the word, ask what you will. Well, how can he ask what you will? Because what you will will be what he wills. 
The better I read, the more I read the Word, the better I get to know God. I've done some teaching in seminary, and, and I, I've learned that the students study the professor as much as they study the text. You students do this. You, now, this professor works this way, and this one gives this kind of exams, and this is the way that... The better we know God, the easier it is to talk to him. So if you abide in me, that's prayer, and my words abide in you, that's the word, ask what you will, because what you will will be getting closer and closer to closer to what I will. The will of God is thirdly accomplished by the people of God. Got to be available to be a part of the answer. Can't say, here am I, Lord, send Aaron. Number four, the will of God is done to the delight of God. Do you know why we do the will of God? To make God happy. Dear friends, don't worship a God who is in prison. I meet people who have the idea that God is the victim and the prisoner of his attributes. He's a very stoical God. A God who is... Uh, like a, like a glacier. No, no, no. God's not the prisoner of his attributes. God doesn't forgive because forgiveness is a part of his character. God is free. Our Lord is, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Our God is free. And did you know that our God expresses his emotions? Remember, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Read the Gospel of John. It's rather interesting. The Gospel of John's goal, purpose, is to show that Jesus is God, and it shows how human he is. He went to a wedding. God goes to a wedding. Talks to a prostitute. <laughs> Feeds a, a crowd. You see God with bread in his hands. You see God with a baby in his arms. You see him weep. On at least three occasions during his earthly ministry, according to the scriptural record, he wept. I once made the statement over at Word of Life Conference that Jesus was filled with joy. He laughed. Our Lord had a sense of humor. Just read some of the parables. Those people must have laughed out loud when he told some of those stories. You know, we read them so piously. Our Lord had a sense of humor. And he laughed. He was joyful. So how do you know? Well, he said to his disciples before he went to the cross, I want my joy to be in you. Now, if he had never smiled, never laughed, they would have said, your joy. We've never seen any joy. They didn't say a word. I know he was a man of sorrows, but that's the Christian life. The Christian life is deeper depths of sorrow and higher heights of joy. It's a land of hills and valleys. My Lord was joyful. God wants to express himself to us. Turn to the Gospel of John, if you will, please. And here we're going to close. John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. No master explains to a servant. Just do it. But God doesn't do that. But I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. In the Gospel of John, the servants knew what was going on. The servants knew where the wine came from in John 2. The servants knew when the little boy was healed in John 4. The servants knew what was going on. You want to know what's going on? Serve him. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be his friends, and friends express their emotions to one another. And that's why Jesus prayed, or taught us to pray, Father, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we usually interpret that to mean you serve God the way the angels do. I couldn't begin to serve God the way the angels do. First place, angels don't have bodies to tie them down. They're spirits. They can be here and boom, there. Why, you, you could, on the freeways in Chicago, you could miss a car payment. Just sitting there waiting for the traffic to move. I can't move like the angels can. I don't get God's direct communication the way the angels do. Sometimes I make mistakes. Angels don't make mistakes. I don't have the power they have. One angel showed up and 185,000 soldiers were dead. I haven't got that kind of power. That's intimidating if you say, I've got to serve God the way the angels do. But there's one thing the angels do that I can do. Psalm 103. Verse 21, bless the Lord, all you his hosts, that means his heavenly army, you ministers of his, that means the angels, who do his pleasure. When Jesus says you serve God like the angels do, he doesn't expect you to do miracles or never to get tired. You know what he says? Those angels behold the face of God, and their delight is to please God. Don't do your work grudgingly or of necessity. You ministers of his who do his pleasure. The will of God is done to please God. That's why the psalmist said, delight yourself also in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, now, read that carefully. You know what he's saying? If you delight in the Lord, the desires of your heart will be his desires. And you'll want more than anything else to please him. It's like a husband and a wife. They live to please each other. And so the will of God is done for the delight of God. You start reading the New Testament and you start looking for the word love. In Matthew, this is my beloved son. Mark, first time you find it, my beloved son. Luke, first time you find it, my beloved son. John, the first time you find it, God loved the world. And I can understand God loving his son. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. John comes along and says, if you are doing what you're doing to please God, nothing pleases him so much as a concern for a lost world. At the end of his earthly ministry, our Lord prays there in John 17, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. He brought joy to the heart of his father. I do always those things that please him. That's the heart of prayer. And so when we pray, your will be done. on earth as it is in heaven. What we're saying is this, Father, please show me your will. I'm willing to obey. Now, if you're not willing to obey, he won't show you. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know. John 7:17. 7, Father, I'm willing to do your will. Show me your will. Help me to do your will. Help me to do it from my heart. And help me to do it to please you. Oh, how that transforms your prayer life. For the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven. It's to get God's will done on earth. And what a privilege we have to be partners in accomplishing his will. Father, thank you. 
thank you so much. We have too often looked upon prayer as an opportunity to get things. But Jesus teaches us that it's a great privilege to be able to do things. And so guide us in our praying that we might delight your heart. Oh, so change us within that the things that please you please us. And may our hearts be broken by the things that break your heart. And may our hearts rejoice in the things that rejoice your heart. And most of all, help us to glorify the Lord Jesus, for that rejoices you the most. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.